for tonight, I, I, I sense that um, some of the things I want to talk about is how are we in the new year going to actually become impactful in the kingdom of God? And there's something that uh, I, I feel like culture has, has done really well. And it's worked in the culture that we live in today uh, for quite some time, and that is negativity. Uh, I- I- anything you look at um, on, on TV, on the news, it's all negative. It depends on whatever it is. It's, uh, it's very much exploded in any way, shape, or form. People want to know the most negative part that happens. When people come, they always tell you what the negative part is. And it seems to be that that kind of transcends worldwide, wherever you look at Negativity actually sells. And I'm actually, it, it sells so much that it actually becomes part of our culture. And our culture has become part of, that's, that's where we kind of find our identity a lot of times. If, if, I, my ne- if my accident or my story is worse than yours, I'm actually better than you. And I sense that that is the way the enemy works our program just on a negative way and how could it be that we actually start working the pr- the god set program about being positive about being truthful about what god says about us about actually looking at how we can build a culture that is based on truth and based on what god thinks about us and i felt like if that's something that actually is possible because the negative works why wouldn't the positive work just think about it if the negative works why wouldn't the positive work and I feel that uh, for us to build a kingdom we need to be different and we need to somehow do it in such a way that actually everybody can understand and basically what companies do companies um, very much have a vision, have a goal, what they're doing, and they start breaking it down to the v- most smallest denominator to make everybody understand why they're going that direction. And I feel that we in the kingdom of God have to do the same thing. We have to start breaking down things in such a small way that we actually, as we live our life, because it's not them and us, it's all of us. So the way we live our lives with them becomes so impactful to them that they want to just apply what we're applying and I believe the kingdom of God is only going to grow when we start losing our um, our way how do we live life in such a way that they and everybody doesn't feel included but they feel included we're just doing things in a way that hopefully they will look at and go why are you doing it that way why are you always this way everybody's this way why are you this way and I feel we have to start getting better at how to be different in this society in such a way that we actually create a culture that actually lives like that. A culture that lives like that. And one act of generosity doesn't make you a generous person. One act of kindness doesn't make you a kind person. One act of love doesn't make you a loving person. Just getting married doesn't make you a good spouse. Just having kids doesn't make you a good father or mother. It is the continuity of doing something repeatedly, something that is your nature, that you actually do without thinking because this is who you are. That's when culture is established. And so we need to figure out how do we do in 2019, how are we going to create create a culture that actually is self-sustaining because of the renewing of the mind and continual encounters with the Lord in such a way that we actually have a transformation in such a way that people who do life with us become jealous to find out what is it that we do so different than they do without us saying them and us, right? But they, we do life with them. I think the biggest influence we can have is when we do life with people that they see that the way we do life with them, the way we approach difficulties, the way we approach something, that is so tantalizing to them. I believe the biggest impact a believer can have and what sets the believer apart from non-believers is that we actually subscribe that God is good and that nothing is impossible. A, A non-believer cannot 
understand the concept of that supernaturally something can change. But the believer can actually believe that nothing is impossible. Faith is that I don't see nothing, but out of nothing, everything can be created. Out of death, life can come. Out of absolutely nothing, God can create the universe. And the believer has that going for them because nobody else has. <clears throat> the believer has that going for them that I, can, I believe that nothing is impossible. <clears throat> I believe that I have the answers to all the questions. I may not get them right away, but I do have them. And that is, if I walk in confidence in that way in life, <clears throat> that's going to be the difference. So, if I can somehow bring to understand why I do this and how I do this, why I do it and how I do it, I break it down to the simple denominator. And when I break down things to the simple denominator, then I'm no longer just a visionary, but then I'm actually becoming somebody who is a teacher. And many times the best way to teach is not to talk, but to actually live it. Culture cannot be imprinted by talking. Culture can only be imprinted by living. When I do things, people can find out what I do. So if I teach my kid how to tie their shoelaces, if I teach my kid how to put air in the tire, if I teach my anything I teach, I, I don't just describe it. I actually go and I show them how to do it. When you see a little kid, you know, the first things you teach them is how to eat, Right? and then potty, and then how to dress themselves, and then how to comb themselves, and then how to, I mean, you just know all these little things, you start teaching them, and basically, they learn, not because you explained it, they learn because they see you do it, and you teach them how to do it. And we as believers, the ones who actually have a relation with the Lord, we live that out first. And the question always is, how do people learn, is when they know the, how, the why and the how. Why I do this, and how I do this. Why am I like this? It's because of this. And how do I do this? It's because this is how I do it. And when we can be get things to the smallest denominator, we can actually be influential. And that doesn't frustrate people. And it's no longer just that we know things because the biggest frustration in, uh, is, is that when we talk to people that are Christians for a long time, they know Bible verses, but their life doesn't resemble the Bible verse. The life doesn't resemble the true walking, following Jesus Christ. It becomes a religion, it becomes a theology, but it's sometimes really tough to see the actual life. And I believe we want to become people who actually do this. And again, a single act does not create culture. But when we value things, they become instinctive reactions to problems and opportunities. That is when it becomes culture, when it becomes instinctive, when I instinctively just act like that, when I'm instinctively generous, when I'm instinctively kind, when I'm instinctively loving, caring. That is when culture has established. I don't have to think, I need to be nice now. That means you're still in the process, that's good. But when you are done thinking, oh, I have to be nice now, guess what happened? That's culture. So I want to talk a little bit about a couple of things tonight. And one of them is if you have your Bibles, you can open them up Isaiah 58, 9 to 12. And I just want to read a couple of these uh, verses. And I, and I feel like this is a good start. And then we're going to go into what I want to teach on tonight. But uh, the b b bottom line is Isaiah 58, 9, 12 says, Then you will call and the Lord will answer. So I, I want to put the practical application a little bit of a closer to what it really looks like. And it says, when you will call, I will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. And this is what God says now. And I think this is an important part for us, because this is the part where religiosity has to leave the room, and where actually relationship has to start coming in. This is where Christianity on paper, Christianity and intellect has to leave, and it has to start becoming practical in, in every part of our DNA. And so the verse says, if you do away with the yoke of oppression... If we do away with the yoke of oppression, and a yoke is something that people uh, put on steers to make them do what they wanted to do. 
Oppressing people is you no longer have a free will, but you actually are doing what I call you and what I want you to do. That means I'm not serving you, but you are actually enslaved to what I want you to do. And I believe that the church has to become a part of a, of a, uh, of a family structure that actually frees people to actually happen. That's the biggest thing, is when we can free people for them to actually happen. Many of us, we live life in such a way that life actually starts directing us instead of us directing life. And we start, really, uh, we start very young. We start our uh, kids very young when they are grown. Actually, we tell them they have to have school, then homework, then all this other kind of stuff, project, then karate, then soccer, then ballerina, then whatever else, and then to bed. And we really don't put God in there. And when kids grow up and they become young adults, they, it's the same thing with college. And once college, then it's maybe your wife and your kids, and then it's your job, and then it's promotion, and then it's whatever else it is. But actually life is taken away from us because it makes us busy, and we actually never take ownership of actually what God called us to be. So actually we're actually in behind because everything else is riding us. And I don't believe that's what God called us to do. And so if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointy finger and malicious talk, and I, I believe that's a big part of us being judgmental. We kind of read other people's thoughts. We read other people's um, examples of life because our past actually, we imprinted what happened in the past and we use our past to actually control the future because we are feared, we are fearful. And if you spend yourself on, in behalf of the hungry, and I feel that's this important part is that spending ourselves, that means really like a drink offering, if we pour ourselves out on behalf of the hungry. And hungry people are people who actually have lost everything. So if you're hungry, most of you, if you have lived in a third world country, hungry people are people who don't own anything anymore. Hungry people are those, you see, you can say, I'm hungry. And you can be like Isa, who came in and says, I'm hungry, I'm starved. And he could have waited 20 minutes. He could have had a really, or, or two hours, whatever it is, until the meat is cooked. And he could have had something. But I believe hungry is somebody who actually is totally destitute. And maybe we don't understand that concept, what it means in America. But when people are hungry, where I came from in South America, I mean, literally, they don't have barely even clothes on. They have nothing of value to them. They are literally starving. And that's called hungry. And so when God says to, to the hungry, we have to spend ourselves to the hungry, it's those who are, actually have nothing anymore. Everything is used up, and they, they're literally waiting for salvation. <clears throat> but he says, so in other words, when we take away, we're no longer oppressing people. We're no longer pointing fingers and laughing at people and talking about them. And we actually are looking to see if we can help those who are hungry. And we satisfy the needs of the oppressed. We satisfy their needs. That's a tall measure right there. So if our heart goes into that direction, he says, then your light will rise in the darkness and your light will become like the noonday. Imagine... We are in a place in a society today where we can actually start putting that to practice. And again, it's not just about the physical hunger that I need my bagel and cream cheese, but actually talks about my emotional hunger. It's not just physical. I want to bring it into a spiritual place that there is an emotional hunger to find out why I'm actually here. And you and I, as we walk alongside people, we share, we share with them the how and the why. He said, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. In other words, there's going to be really tough times in a sun-scorched land. That means there is no greenery, there's nothing, but he will provide for you. And I believe that the principle of a believer is one that actually we go where God calls us to go. And it doesn't make a difference where that is, but because we know he's always going to provide. Even if it's in a sun-scorched land, even if things totally not go our way, 
God is going to provide. Because he says, and will strengthen your frame, you will be like a well-watered garden. How awesome is that? Like a spring whose water never fails. That's how we're going to be. If we just take, do away with our elevating ourselves, but we actually humble ourselves before the Lord. And we actually find out what we're really created to be. And then it says, when we get there, because we were not there, now we're here. Then he says, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up age-old foundations. You will be called repair of the broken walls. In other words, as we actually start walking in that anointing, in that restoration, we are going to actually help other people start becoming those amazing people that God created. They're actually going to start hanging out with us because they're going to find they're called, their DNA is calling unto a restoration. Their heart is calling to be fulfilled. Not just for two seconds, but to be fulfilled. Restore of streets of dwelling. How awesome. In Psalm 34, we talk about that God is... The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. Now that's a really good verse. What I don't like about the verse is that in verse 19, it says, Psalm 34, verse 19, a righteous man may have many troubles. We don't like that idea. But I feel that when we don't understand that, a righteous man may have many troubles. And if you've walked our life and you've walked your life, you're going to find that you have encountered many troubles. But the question is, how have we encountered those troubles? How have we actually dealt with them? What was our culture as those things have started coming towards us? How did we respond? The why and the how. Why did you do that and how did you do that? When we're walking in this culture today, when, we, when problems come, when troubles come, why and how is what people are going to ask. Why are you doing it that way? Well, how do you do that? And if we don't have a way how to answer that, then we're no longer better than anybody else because we're just people walking. But I believe God has called us to actually give him the why and the how because that's what impacts culture. He says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all, all their troubles. Not just some, but from all their troubles. It doesn't say instantly, but he does deliver them. It doesn't say instant, but he will deliver. So I believe that's a problem that we don't know, quite know, understand. We want instant. Come on now, I prayed. What's going on? And it's not how God works. Now, very uh, quickly, I just want to mention this, and we talked about this many times before, but I do want to just mention it because it's the context. In James chapter 3, verse um, 13, who is wise and understanding among you, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So how and why? How do I do this and why do I do this? Why do I do this? How do I do this? These are the two questions that I have to also be ready to... Be, uh, talk to people about it when they ask. But they're going to ask this question if they see it in my, in my day. Not just in my words, but if they see it in the way I walk. They're going to ask that question. When troubles come to me, why are you doing this? How are you doing that? Those are questions that are valid questions. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven. So when we're walking with them and we actually have this kind of bitter envy, selfish ambition in our hearts, what's happening is that we're actually dealing on earthly wisdom. We're not dealing in godly wisdom. And so when we're walking with people, they're not going to ask why and how. Actually, their response to troubles are, that's how you deal with it. And that's part of what the broadcast has been for many, many years is the negative broadcast. Cut people down, divide them, tell them off, do whatever you can, but for sure don't love them. But you and I are in a different place because we no longer work under earthly wisdom, we work under godly wisdom. And that's different. And there's a reason why it's different.
He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from desires that, uh, your desires that battle within you? Of course, we all want something. And I want it now. You want something, but you don't get it. It says, you will covet and kill, but you cannot have what you want. Bummer. And God says, you don't have it because you ask not. Well, I was trying to get it myself. Why should I need to ask? And I think this is where I find it becomes interesting. You have not because you ask not. And if I want to be honest, I don't ask because I'm an adult now. I have to provide for myself. I, I, I don't even understand the concept of asking anymore because, you know, as a little kid, when I asked my mom and dad something, I, you know, mom and dad really didn't exist anymore, it didn't happen anymore, and, you know, if I wanted something, I had to do it myself. And the enemy has been fighting the family structure for years, and he's been very successful in the last probably 70 years where he broke down family structure in such a way that we no longer have the understanding of asking because if you want to do it yourself, the part of serving no longer is a concept because it's all about fairness. It's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. We don't understand the word, if he hits you on the left side, give him the right side. If he takes your tunic, give him another one. If he takes your money, let it go. Wait a moment, that's not how we live life. We sue them. But why and how, how and why has to be the answer. Well, they, they, our life needs to be lived such a way that they need to wonder, why are you doing that? How do you do that? It needs to be lived in such a way. And if we don't live in the why and how for other people, then what is different? I'm just saying, you know. So we come to this verse that I feel is the answer. But we don't do a good job at it. And I don't mean that to shame anybody, but I believe our culture has come to the place where it actually has robbed every person of his innocence. And has robbed everybody of something that God says the only way for us to achieve and accomplish what we are to do, that is something we, we despise. We do not want that. Because it's degrading. I don't want you talking like that to me in the, in the first place. It's very degrading if you talk like that to me. Because I'm an adult. I have experience. I don't want you talking like that to me. There's no other way how to get in it. And this is it is. But those who embrace him and took hold of his name, were given the authority to become children. Become children of God. That's in John 1, 12, but actually it says it even better in Matthew 18, verse 3. And he said, I'll tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Have you ever thought about that? I'll, I can talk to Peter, and Peter said, do you know God? And he goes, yeah, he's my healer. Great. I tell Denise, and she goes, oh, yeah, he's my provider. Okay, that's great. Over there, he's my protector. Over there, whatever you want to say about God, he's my savior. How cool is that? But he never came to show himself off as a healer. He never came to show himself as a savior. He never came. He sh came because he wants to be recognized as one thing only, and that's he wants to be recognized as a father. And only children can represent the father. Nobody else can represent the father. Only a child can represent who the father is. And if we don't want to actually get back into that we are children, we're never going to actually represent the father. We can always bring people to the healer. We can bring people to the one who knows it all. We can bring people to the all-wise God. <clears throat> but we will never represent who the Father is if we don't become children. And it goes into every part of our DNA to say, wait a moment, 
Don't talk to me like a child. How many times do we hear that? <clears throat> I'm coming down with something. I don't have time for that. I don't, I, I don't have time for that. So, <clears throat> But how many of us have this issue? You talk to me like you're my mom. You talk to me like my dad. I'm not a kid. You don't talk to me like that. And I understand some people just have this idea that they have to teach everybody. I'm not saying that's all good. But I believe that when Scripture says, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children. We have to become like children. We ha if we want to represent the Father, the only way to represent the Father is if I acknowledge that I'm a child of God. So I want to walk you through this about what that looks like. Learning to be a son and a daughter <clears throat> is one of, one, one of the biggest things of sons and daughters is obedience. You obey what mom and dad say. There is no option. I don't know. But obviously, that doesn't happen anymore. You watch Walt Disney, kids become the parents of the parents. Culture has totally uh, erased the honor that parents actually carry, the weight that actually parents carry. And so the church now is in the dilemma because we don't, when we talk about family structure and family values, they have no clue what that looks like. Most people come from broken families, broken homes. There is no structure of a family structure. And every structure that you want to even somehow attain to and, or, or embrace has negativity from everybody. So nobody really likes a mom. Nobody really likes a dad because there's bad experiences. Nobody even likes my brother and whatever else, cousins, because it's all bad. And so when God the Father says, the only way you're actually going to represent me is a, like a child... And the family structure is broken, so how are we going to actually do that? Where's the why, and how is the, how, the why, where is it? Because why do you do that? Well, I'm a child. Well, what does that look like? That's bad. How? Well, because I'm a child. Whose? My father's. Are you with me? So gaining the concept of what actually it means to be a child of God <clears throat> is an important part. And I know when we're grown ups, we don't really like that idea, but I loved it when my father was 50 years old and <clears throat> he, uh, we were in Germany and he was visiting his, we were visiting his grandmother and she would grab him by the cheeks and goes, so when are you going to be home? But my dad, what are you talking about? But my mom, his mom would grab him like this by the cheek and say, when are you going to be home? I thought, oh my gosh, that's the weirdest thing. He grabs, she grabs my dad. Well, of course, she, he's the, she's the mom. She can do that, and my dad loved it. Right? Why wouldn't you? You're the child. Your identity is a child, so you will love when your mom or your dad treats you like a child. Oh, no, no, we don't want that, right? I'm all grown up now. Let me tell you, you're always my child. You can be a grown child, but you're always my child. That doesn't mean I belittle you, but you're always my child because I'm your dad. That structure never changes. And in the church, it can never change either. We as believers, as followers of God, we have to be the people who actually identify as children of God. <clears throat> and so... We have to learn to be obedient. <clears throat> when we know what it is to be a son and daughter of God, I just want to read a couple things. I don't have much time left. So I have to talk fast again. If I'm a son and a daughter of God, then I'm confident in what my dad says. I'm totally confident in what he says. Total, utter confidence that his word is true. My kid, when he was young, I would tell him to jump. He would jump. Why? Because I said so. Wouldn't make any difference if it made sense or not. Why? Because he trusted me. And I insisted on my kids. I made him do really crazy things. 
Why? Because I can. I wanted them to learn to trust me, and that's why I did crazy things. But you know, but the point is, is that they actually have total confidence in their dad. So if I don't have confidence in my father, what I'm actually saying is that God is abusive. I don't trust him. And what kind of a father picture are we giving the world if we are not people who have total confidence in our father? I'm just saying. And I know, well, my dad was a jerk. My mom was a total jerk. I get that. But I want to tell you, you're old enough now to say, you know what, maybe my mom and dad were challenged in some area, whatever that is. But you know what, my father is not. Because he sent his son to die for me. And that actually speaks volumes. So, other thing is that I'm confident that everything that my dad owns is mine. That everything that he owns, everything, not just a little bit, everything that he owns is actually mine. In other words, we call it, it's my inheritance. That means I don't worry about where money's coming. I don't worry where any, because I come from abundance. Or your dad's a total loser because he doesn't give me anything. I'm always walking around with nothing. We represent the father like he is one of those who doesn't really care about us because the way we act is not like he's the one who generously gives, but we act like he's not a rewarder. How and why? The question, do we act like children? Because then we can ask. Then we can answer the why and the how. No, the beautiful part is because I am the son of my dad, I have authority. And what my dad has authority, I have authority. So I can go anywhere where my dad is, goes. Why? Because my dad owns the place. And excuse me, if somebody stops me, I go, excuse me, I'm his son. I go wherever I want. Right? That's how that works. But if I don't believe that I have the same authority as my dad, then I'm just not going to do that. We have to learn what it actually means. And you see, because we have such a distorted father picture, we, we don't even believe that anymore. We believe that's actually weird. And we give a weird father picture to the world. The father tells us we have all authority. I own everything that my father owns. Every part, my father delights in giving me. I remember my dad says, hey, you know what? All we have, it's what we, it's all yours. I tell my kids all the time, hey, this is your house. If you break it, you got to fix it. I mean, it's just the way it is. Because, I mean, I'll do it as much as I can, but, you know, this is your inheritance. Everything that we have is part of your inheritance. It's not mine. It's all about you. I'm spending my life for you. That's what parents do. That's what Jesus did. God the Father sent us and he spent his life for us. That's what that looks like. I carry his name, his plan, his vision, his purpose. I continue my dad's legacy. Hello? I know today we're so smart. Well, you just want to do all the other things. But let me tell you, there's something in your family legacy that you carry. And if you don't do those things, guess what? You're never going to be as fulfilled as you can be. I'm not trying to narrow you. Because that's what the enemy No. I believe that there's something that every family carries. And that you are here to carry it. And if you don't want to carry it, that's fine. But you're never going to live a fulfilled life. Because your father worked for it. You see, I carry the legacy of, the, uh, 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 of, the, uh, of God. I carry that. I have, I'm created in his image. Every child is created in his image. And so we, create, we actually carry the image of my father wherever I go. And I, and I do what? I, I build the kingdom of the, my father. I'm about my father's business. I carry the legacy of my father. I'm not going to start doing my own thing. 
You see, but we don't have that kind of a thing. But in Germany back 100 years ago, when you were a farmer, you were a farmer. Actually, in Europe, the way it was, your name was, actually, your last name was given to you by kind of the work that you do. And that was actually your name. So they're very weird names. Because of whatever job you had, that was your last name. And so what we want to understand is that we carry the legacy of our fathers. We don't try to invent the wheel. We believe that our, our, our identity is based upon what my father is. My father is God. And he said, go and what? Give, spread the good news all over the world. Heal the sick, cleanse the, Do that. Raise the dead. Do that. Carry his legacy. Represent me as a child. And when you, the world sees how you and why you trust me that much, that shows the world what a father I am. I'm always confident, secure, because my father will always love me. You see, I don't walk around thinking, oh my God's going to punish me, I just messed up so bad. I'm always going to be, my father forgives me because my father's always, my kid, you know, I believe that we need to learn that when our kids make mistakes, most people just get ticked off and throw them away. Or they don't want to deal with them. Or they have passive aggressive behavior. Or they punish them and do whatever else. But what about treating them like God treats us? What about? Basic truth is I know that my father has always the best in store for me. My father always has the best in store for me. I don't trust, I don't doubt God. If he says, go to Africa, I'm not going to say, I don't want to go there. If he says, quit your job and go do this, I'm not going to stop doing it just because. No, if my father says, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Why? Because he knows what's best for me. Right? Getting quiet. He always protects me. I'm not going to tell, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not, I'm not a fearful person. He always protects me. He always encourages me. He always talks to me. He always pursues me. He's always very clear. He holds me always to my highest. He always disciplines me, but he doesn't punish me. Nothing is ever too expensive or nothing ever comes between me and the Father because he has a fierce protection over me. I'm not getting to any of the other stuff, but I'm done here. But I just want us to understand that I want us to hear that we have a powerful mandate to influence culture. And we are very capable of doing that when we actually act like children of the Father. If we just act like People who know the healer, know the provider, know this, but we don't act like children, then God the Father never gets the picture across to the world. And I want us to believe that the Father says that we need to become like children. In other words, although we're adults and we're maturing in the Lord, we always address him as the Father in the way we get our identity from him. That's what the people are going to look at. And in that, what they look at, they're going to start asking the question, why do you do it? And how? And we are able then to communicate to them why and how. Amen? God bless you guys.